Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. I hope this podcast and my blog and books have been helpful resources for you and will continue to be. But if you've been struggling with a chronic health problem and are feeling stuck, consider coming to work with my team and me at the California Center for Functional Medicine. We work with patients all over the U.S. and have experience treating a wide range of conditions, including GI problems, autoimmunity, hypothyroidism, cognitive mood and behavioral issues, weight gain and metabolic dysfunction, and more. Our unique model teams, clinicians with nurse practitioners and health coaches, all of whom are trained in my ADAPT framework approach to provide a high level of care to our patients. This means more support between appointments, personalized guidance on diet, lifestyle, and behavior change, a cutting edge patient portal with 24 seven access to your labs and records, handouts and resources to guide your protocols, and a team of practitioners working together on your case. We're currently accepting new patients, so if you'd like to learn more, visit chriscresser.com slash become a patient. Daryl Edwards, my man, good to see you. How are you doing, Chris? How's things? Things are well. It was good to see you the, the one time a year that I usually get to see you at Paleo <laughs> FX last year. Yeah. It's usually either Paleo FX or if I happen to be in London doing some Yes, yes, yeah. that's, that's true. So, uh, yeah, Paleo FX is definitely uh, one of the highlights of my of my calendar for sure. So it's yeah. a pleasure to see you, Chris. And usually I see you like running from one room to the next or outside crawling around on the ground with people on top of you or vice versa or something like that, <laughs> which, is, is, which is cool <laughs> because that's what primal play is all about, right? That's right. Yeah, it's about, about having fun with movement. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not spending much time relaxing whilst the paleo effects yeah, i don't see you sitting in chairs very <laughs> often there and, and watching talks and stuff you're busy helping people learn how to move in a that's more sure. effective way and that's what i'm excited to talk to you about today because you know this is i, I think we see eye to eye on this you know that, that there's a couple of big problems to, with the modern approach to movement one is is the biggest problem, which is just, there's not enough of it. <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot of, you know, just being completely sedentary is the biggest problem where people are just sitting, you know, I think in the U S the stats are six and a half hours a day on average. So of course yeah. that's, a, that's an average. So we know that, you know, a lot of people are sitting a lot more than that, like 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, sure. Someone, you know, rides in the car to work, they commute for an hour, they go, they're sitting in a chair in their desk for eight hours. They sit, you know, on the way home in the car, they sit, they have some dinner and they go on the couch and watch a couple hours of TV. I mean, that sets 12 hours easily right there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, we definitely have a, an epidemic of, of sedentary lifestyles. And so I spend a lot of my time trying to educate people about the dangers of that and speak about that and, and provide the, the research and the evidence base around that. But also there are times where, you know, there's, there's enough talking about this. You right. know, we all kind of know instinctively that we feel better when we move. There are significant benefits to our physiology when we move. And um, we are also averse to movement. So, you know, we're, we're designed to conserve calories. Right. <laughs> so if we're going to be choosing to burn calories, to expend energy, then oftentimes it needs to be fun. Otherwise, we choose not to do it, right? It's easier to sit on the couch watching Netflix yeah. than it, <laughs> oftentimes in thinking, you know what, I'm going to get my training gear on and head outside. I'm going to go on the Stairmaster for a while. <laughs> yeah, and watch, and watch Netflix. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that leads us to the second problem. And I want to come back to that uh, evolutionary mechanism because I think that's really actually important for people to understand. They, they often feel like there's something wrong with them if they're not motivated to you know go run on the treadmill for an hour but that's a biologically hardwired mechanism as you said to conserve energy because because we never had a problem of not moving enough in the natural world it was more like you know the, the risk was expending too much energy and then becoming a target you know for a predator because you couldn't run away because you were too tired <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly uh, we don't have that problem now but so yeah, it's, it, I think it relieves a lot of guilt and shame and blame when people understand that and it, it opens up the possibility of, uh, hey, look, let's try to find some ways of moving that are more fun and more likely for you to uh, actually want to do it. But the other you know, big problem we have, and I know you talk about this a lot, is okay, let's say someone, you know, someone's not totally sedentary, they're following the, the government issued recommendations on activities, so they're 
dutifully going to the gym, you know, three, three to five days a week. And they're on that Stairmaster for, you know, 30 minutes and then they're lifting some weights. That's great. I mean, that's certainly a big improvement over not moving at all, but what's the problem with that approach? Yeah. Well, I think we always need to step back and look, you know, through, uh, an evolutionary lens, right? Through a biological lens, through a, an ancestral lens. And when doing so, you'll recognize very quickly that exercise is a, is a substitute, it's a proxy for the physical activity we used to get, you know, for survival. You right. know, what we used to have to do day to day just to survive meant there was a requirement for movement of all types of persuasions. So very low intensity, you know, kind of pottering around right through to, to high intensity, very strong, powerful movements, lots of different movement patterns. So whether it be crawling, running, jumping, climbing, looking at different vantage points, you know, a successful kill, you got to bring the hunt back to, okay. to be able to, to, yeah, you got to carry it, you know, for, for, for several miles usually in order to get back to, to camp, to then prepare the food to, to, for everyone to share. And so, I think there are two things wrong or that we could get more right about conventional fitness. So one is we try to, we use a reductionist approach to movement and fitness. So we say, you know what, as long as I'm moving, there's a benefit. It doesn't really matter what I do. So if I'm just doing aerobic activity, that's a tick in the box. If I just go to the gym and lift weights, isn't that good enough? Actually, no, we need a more holistic approach to movement. And we need to consider that as humans, we are, we're kind of a jack of all trades and a master of none when it comes to movement. We are pretty average at best <laughs> when we compare ourselves to other members of the animal kingdom. Yeah. We're you not know, if I, we're not yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're not, we're not the best at, uh, you know, we can't balance on one leg like a flamingo, right? Mm -hmm. We can't climb trees like as well as monkeys. We can't sprint like a cheetah. Even, you know, I was looking at Usain Bolt's top speed. Camels can out sprint, <laughs> can outrun Usain Bolt, you know, right. wild sheep. Yeah, and a out. cheetah is like <laughs> zero to 60 in something ridiculous. It's like three or four seconds or something. Yeah, for, you know, for sure. Like the fastest cars, you know, on the road. Yeah, would struggle. Yeah, would struggle yeah. to keep up. And, you know, and, they, and evolution, nature is given, has given them that advantage uh, in order to be successful. And even for a cheetah, they're not that successful when it comes to hunting. Uh -uh. You know, even though they can out sprint an antelope, you know, they are still relatively unsuccessful. You know, I think it's something yeah. like, Four, four out of five hunts for right. cheetah are successful. Successful, right? They don't have a lot of endurance either. They, yes, they, exactly. Yeah. They burn out within a few within a few seconds. They can only maintain top speed for about four or five seconds. Right. And if an antelope gets away, the weakest, slowest antelope, if they get away, you know, um, the cheetah's got to hope that it has enough energy to go back right. and hunt again. So right. humans, on the other hand, even though we are not very adept at specializing in movement. We are very good at being generalists of movement. And so that's one of the problems with modern day fitness is that we try to focus on only what we enjoy and only what we feel that we are good at. So I'm a great runner, I'm great at endurance. So I'll focus on running, maybe get on a bike, maybe do some swimming. I wanna become a triathlete. Mm -hmm. And to get better at that, to get fitter at that, I need to go longer distances, more volume, and that's what I'll do. To the to detriment of other components of fitness, and I believe if you if you put uh, fitness onto an evolutionary landscape, then you'll start picking out all of these different movement patterns that we need. You won't sacrifice one area of specialism for all the others. So, in other words, you'll focus on your balance and your coordination and agility and your strength and your speed and your stamina and your ability to, to interact with the environment, which is also more important and you won't be over relying on one piece of equipment or your gym you know you'll recognize that the world around you can become become your gym and the second problem i would say is that exercise has become a chore it's often seen uh, seen as punishment for what you ate the night before you mm -hmm. know as a way to get you know i'm going to, i'm going to go on the beach in six on my two-week vacation in six months I want to get myself in shape so I look great with a t-shirt off, you know. That, that seems to be the motivation, very short term, based on aesthetics, or maybe making money for charity, charity event, 
you know, I'm going to run a 10K. And so we don't have a great love affair with exercise. You know, it's, we have lots of short-term love affairs, you know, like New Year's Day, that's it. I'm dedicating myself, my whole life to movement. Give it two or three weeks and we ditch. (laughs) I think, yeah, less than than 8% of people are still doing their New Year's resolution six months later. You know, there's a few statistics thrown around about that. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I can understand why, again, and, yeah. and we shouldn't beat ourselves up about this. Yeah. You know, we're, uh, I don't want to say we're designed to be lazy, but we're definitely designed to conserve, conserve energy because evolutionary, we didn't know where our next meal was coming from, right? Yeah. So you wouldn't just recreationally decide, hey, let's just let's burn go for a jog. <laughs> yeah, let's just go running around just because yeah. we can. Recreational activities would come after the success of, wow, successful hunt, a successful, you know, a great meal. Now we yeah. can go and have a dance. Now we have surplus you know? <laughs> calories to burn. To burn. Yes, Basically. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's by the same token, of course, that's the problem with food. You know, we're conditioned to seek out highly rewarding and palatable foods because we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. So if we had really calorie dense foods available, we were going to eat as much of that stuff as we can. And that's, you know, there, there are hunter gatherer groups like the Ache and, and Paraguay who have been observed eating up to a liter of honey at, at one time when they find, you know, a source or a beehive and they'll climb tre- 150 feet up in trees where, you know, they could fall and die just to get this honey and they'll risk being stung by hundreds of bees in order to do this. So, I mean, that's the environment we grew up in, not the one where you can walk down to 7-Eleven and get an unlimited amount of calories anytime you want. So, yeah, it's, exactly. so those mechanisms promoted survival, right, in the, in the natural world, but they're really, in some ways, working against us in this modern world. Yes, for sure. In the 21st century, you know, we're bombarded with, with, with convenience. So, so most of our ancestral heritage was based on inconvenience you know it's difficult to to locate food which meant we were nomadic right we didn't just stay in one location because if we did we'd be depleting uh, yeah. food resources so yeah. we were fantastic at our ability to to locom you know for locomotion via walking significant distances to ensure there was always access to food and then somebody had a bright idea that maybe you know raising animals and planting seeds and agriculture was uh, was advantageous but it meant there was less requirement to move on that basis you know because we don't need to hunt we can oh my gosh we can just harvest once a year and you know a few times a year we can get access to food and and we can raise animals and so this we've gone from a significant amount of movement requirement from day to day and that's gradually been trickled down to now in the 21st century where you mentioned walking to the 7-Eleven. I mean, we know now 24 seven, you can, you know, you can click a button on your mouse and get food delivered. Yeah, you don't even need uh, to walk to the 7-Eleven. Yeah. <laughs> Most yeah, people exactly. aren't doing that, right? <laughs> exactly. And you know, we've got smart fridges now with internet access, but I mean, I can imagine a day where you'll just, you'll just wish, yeah. you, know, you know what? Oh, I would love to eat X, Y, Z. And it'll just, yeah. It'll just probably appear. Yeah, you know? <laughs> your, your, your personal AI assistant will just know that you're ready for a snack, and the you know it'll pop up right there. So. Yeah, ex- exactly. Or you oh just my gosh. have an IV line and it's just you know <laughs> mainline into your vein or something. Yes, yes. Your your ghrelin levels are uh, right. you know, are activated. You know, here you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, That's we don't want to have any- <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm curious, I want to talk about another, I think, benefit of your approach and you call it animal moves, which I think is really appropriate because we often forget that we're animals, right? I mean, we, we, we certainly are different from most other animals in a lot of important ways, but we're also similar. And I think our modern existence, one of the consequences of that is people tend to have a very limited experience of their animal body. And, you know, it might be limited to sitting for a long time standing and then maybe a kind of repetitive movements like jogging or stairmaster they don't really have a full rich experience of the dynamism and you know fullness of the human form and everything that it's capable of and i think that's to some extent responsible for a lot of stuff you know like a disconnection from the sexual and sensual self and and the way that gets played out in 
you know, yes. addiction to pornography and all this, this stuff, there's not, not really a full rich experience of being human. So can you talk yes. a little bit about that? I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic point. And, you know, I cover a lot of research on my website around movement as medicine and why movement is so important to our physiology. So we know, for example, that, you know, this interesting research about the gut microbiome, for example, those who have a higher VO2 max in a control population. So looking at rugby players, mm-hmm. right? So control for diet, control for other lifestyle mechanisms, those who are actually fitter based on peak VO2 max, your ability to process oxygen for energy yeah. have 25% increased volume and diversity of, uh, you know, beneficial gut bacteria. So even something that's, uh, is fairly decoupled, you could argue, you know, movement and the gut microbiome, what's the connection? There is a connection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and every single cell in the body benefits from, from movement. So we muscle contraction, for example, you know, muscles has, has been identified as a, the new endocrine organ, you know, based on the latest research, myokines or, or so the muscle cytokines communicate with organs like, you know, the pancreas, the liver, the heart, and promote healing, reduce in chronic inflammation. So there are anti-inflammatory benefits of pursuing the right type of movement practice. So we're starting to understand now why movement is not only good for prevention of chronic lifestyle disease. So we know the research tells us that it reduces the likelihood of cancer, you know, type 2 diabetes risk, improves your likelihood of surviving from a cardiovascular risk, you know, event for example, but we're now starting to understand the underlying mechanisms as to why, as, as to why that happens. So we've become quite arrogant in some respects, not acknowledging ourselves as animals. And when we're looking after animals, you know, so zookeepers, again, in their misplaced arrogance, decided at one point, you know what, I don't believe our animals are healthy eating meat. You know, right. let's feed them a vegetarian diet because surely that's going to be far more healthy for the animals. And of course, what happens is that the lions lose their libido. You know, they start to get depressed. They start getting sick and they, they decide, oh, there's something else wrong. You know, that what, what's happened in the environment? Actually, guys, <laughs> it's the fact that you're not feeding them what they were designed to eat. Mm-hmm. And it's exactly the same with movement. If you own a dog and you decide, you know what, it's not safe outside. I, you know, I don't want my dog to encounter the elements. It's too far too cold. Let's just sit here and let's watch TV together, pet. We know what's going to happen. That dog becomes depressed. It affects their mood. It affects their body. They'll gain weight. They'll become miserable. They'll die prematurely. Yeah. That's what will happen. So we know that we're not responsible as pet owners if we don't take our dogs out for a walk. But we're also not responsible uh, for our own health if we're not taking ourselves out for walks, if we're not also, you know, and, and we know even with dogs, dogs don't, don't just want to walk, right? Yeah. <laughs> if, right. You know, they want to sprint, they want to chase, they want to catch, they want to explore their environment. You know, they yeah. want to climb, you know, they, there are so many movement patterns they want to engage in. And so we should take a leaf out of observation of other animals, which is why I wrote Animal Moves. So it's one, it's one small part of the, the entire primal play method of if we move like animals, we'll actually become more human. Yeah. You know, it will makes perfect sense. What we're capable of. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. there, you know, so there's this benefit of getting, uh, you know, being able to experience our, our sort of full range of movement as human beings. There's, there's medical and health benefits, which, I mean, look, if you look at the research on just about any condition, exercise is really at the top of the list move let's, let's say movement in yes. general is at the top of the list in terms of the most effective interventions cognitive decline and preventing dementia and alzheimer's like just meeting the the recommended guidelines for movement can reduce the risk in some cases by up to 50 percent, which is just yes. insane like i which mean it's incredible yeah <laughs> imagine if there was a drug that they, they came out tomorrow and they're like hey we got this new drug that reduces alzheimer's risk by 50 percent. i mean that would be a multi-billion dollar it's, yeah drug within minutes of being released <laughs> everyone would be clamoring for it and yet you can get that benefit and many more just by moving your moving. body by moving your body, yeah. So physical activity is more important, 
I would argue, than exercise. Yeah, but absolutely. we're in an environment which means we are forced to be sedentary far more often. So we need exercise in the 21st century because it's a supplement. You know, it's yeah. a supplement for the lack of physical activity that we we get living as a 21st century yeah. Homo sapien. So yeah. so yeah, we need better ways and prescriptions for movement today, which includes this package, this kind of smorgasbord of different movement patterns, which will mean yeah. we'll achieve the, the, the health benefits without having to be outside all day moving, right? Because, yeah. you know, we're office-based, we're working from home, we, you know, we, some of us can't escape having to commute in a car for a couple of hours every day there and back and sit at the desk and Absolutely. we can't have a standing desk or, you know, so we've got to find mechanisms that will enable us to maintain really good health through movement, uh, yeah. making better decisions about movement as we do with food, right? We yeah. plan, we prepare to make healthier food decisions because we are aware of the health benefits and we need to be just as articulate about our, and educated about our movement decisions. So, Trust me, I struggle sometimes. You know, some days I get up and I'm like, I would just love to lie in bed all day. No, like, why not? Wouldn't that be fantastic? And every now and again, get some grapes fed to me and you know, get a <laughs> massage and feel really pampered. But whenever I do spend a lot of time sedent- being sedentary, I now feel... I feel worse afterwards. I feel fatigued. I'm like, I feel muscle soreness. I'm like, how can I be sore when I haven't actually done any movement? You know, mm-hmm. the body starts to decay very, very slowly when you stop moving. And so because I've had the experience now of being, one, being very sedentary. So my former career, I was a computer programmer, 16 to 18 hours a day, every day of the week in front of a series of computer screens, yeah. didn't move. <laughs> I mean, if I moved my head, that would be a problem. You know, it's like, I've got to keep looking at these screens. So coming out of that to then becoming more physically active, going back to any form of sedentarism, I, I feel I'm even more sensitive to, to being, being sedentary. And so many of us aren't aware of, you know, we've got to remove ourselves from our sedentary lifestyle. And then we can become more in tune with what our body needs when it comes to movement. So important. I want to, dive into, you know, some of the specifics of, the, of your program now. So your new book, Animal Moves, came out, I think, in mid-April, right? That's right, um, yeah. And it's available. I've got it pulled up here on Amazon.com in the U.S. So it's, it yes. looks like it's available here on Kindle and paperback, also on the U.K., iBooks. And, all and good stores and all bad stores, Chris. All good and bad stores <laughs> everywhere. Great. Yeah. So I know from the book you've got a 28-day program for beginners, intermediate and advanced that brings these different animal movements together to help help people kind of get a sense of what this type of movement can do for them. And if any of you have been to Paleo FX and you've seen Daryl, you met Daryl else, elsewhere, you know how dynamic and fun that this type of movement can be and how different it is from the typical gym workout. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, what, what happens in these programs. Yeah. So I- I suppose I, I, you know, when I started out, I um, really went hardcore into what could I do to improve my fitness. And I joined a gym and I got into the performance aspects of this, into the sport of fitness. And I was very ultra competitive in my day job. And I took that into the gym environment. And what happened was I was, I was highly self-motivated. So whenever I was winning, Whenever I was doing better at my workout, when I, when I could measure the results of my workout, I felt great. But if I was losing, <laughs> if I wasn't top of the leaderboard, if I didn't see any progress, I hated what I was doing. So it was very results oriented. It wasn't, I didn't enjoy the process. I wasn't in the moment. I wasn't enjoying the moment. I was only enjoying the, the end, end result. And so I couldn't maintain that for the long haul. It was another one of those, hey, this is great for the first year or two when I'm really enthusiastic, but now I don't feel the same motivations to to leave home, to go to the gym and to do that particular workout of the day. So play was was the first kind of like 
you know, eureka moment for me, like, hold on a second. There was a time in my life where I really enjoyed movement and exercise didn't figure in that. And that was when I was outside playing in the summer, you know, in the, in the summer holidays with my friends all day. I didn't complain about muscle soreness the next day. You know, we didn't do stuff that we didn't enjoy. It was like, this game's a waste of time. Let's play something else. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, how, that's how it was. And so that unstructured play, I recognize that as adults, we need a form of structure because that's what we, we like as adults. But we need to have some of the freedom that comes around from exploring movement. And play is a great vehicle in doing so. And I now know that that is a way to keep me in love with movement until the end of my days. So that's how primal play, play came about. It was getting this primal, natural, instinctive movement patterns that we should be engaging in and, and having that synergy with play theory and saying, hey, this could work. You know, I can make movement really effective but have fun at the same time. And so anyone who has taken part in my sessions, who have done my programs online or have read my books, will see that I intersperse play and playful activities throughout, you know, using your imagination, using visualization. Why crawl like a bear, for example? You know, I can either crawl like a bear or I can pretend that I'm in an environment where the bear is. I can pretend that I'm being stalked. I can pretend that I'm a predator. I can become more, more childlike in my approach to movement. Then it becomes far more enjoyable. You know, it isn't staid and static. It becomes more invigorating and joyful. So um, that was really the reason why I created this book is one to say, guys, we need to be moving in all these different ways. But if it just appears like just another hardcore fitness program, people will buy the book and go, mm, it'll be a shelf help book, right? Stays on the shelf. I may look at it next New Year's Day. Uh, so, so I wanted to, to hopefully encourage people to realize just become more inquisitive about yourself and your environment. If you go out for a run tomorrow, don't just take a straight line. You know, use the environment around you. Look at a tree. If you have the permission to climb it, climb it. If you don't have the permission to climb it, still climb it. If you see a bench, interact with the bench. Use that as your gym equipment. If you see some rocks or logs, pick those up. You know, you don't have to be in a gym to lift something heavy. Yeah. If you see somebody you like, like, I, I think, I'm sure I probably picked you up once or twice, Chris, you know, yeah, sure, yeah. Carry. but um, yeah, <laughs> if somebody you like, you yeah. know, you can have a handshake or you can pick them up. <laughs> yeah, pick them up like. <laughs> In other words, act like a six-year-old. Exactly. I, mean, exactly. I have a six-year-old and that's, you know, as you were talking about that, I was like, oh yeah, that's just like Sylvie, my daughter, you know, she jumps on the trampoline outside then she comes inside and, and asks me to turn the jump rope for her. And then she goes and picks something up and then she runs down the street to her friend's house and they start skipping. And, you know, I mean, like, it's really notable to me that we had that, we had, we didn't have to be taught this as kids. I mean, yes. we unlearned how to do this. This is natural in our genes. Yes, but we exactly. unlearn it over time because in, in many ways, it's most, you know, the environment sort of mm. con conditions it out of us. Yes, exactly. And unfortunately, it's not just the environment includes other human beings, right? Yeah. So, so when we were kids, most parents, I would argue, would say, get out of the house, amuse yeah. yourselves, go yeah. and play, right? Yeah. Nowadays, a lot of parents will say, amuse yourself within eyesight, on a smart device, right? You know, do not go outside to play. Right. Yeah, exactly. I want to see. You. I want to see what you're up to. Yeah. I want to supervise you at all times. And so, kids are missing out on on this opportunity to play and to explore their environment and to learn risk assessment and social, that's how to socially interact and how to improve their social and emotional intelligence by interacting with other children. They're different you know, different peer groups and all the, all the challenges that we had as children, which if you try to avoid them all, you know, and create this really sanitized environment becomes more detrimental actually for our children than, than beneficial. And I'm sure you're aware of, there's some really interesting research by, by Stuart Brown, who wrote yeah. a book called play yeah. and, and he, his observations were that kids who was, who were play deprived, who were deprived of active play are more likely to you know unfortunately become serial killers and more like to become death row. and then some death row for sure mm -hmm. right so you know it sounds quite alarmist 
in order to say that, but you know, we know children who are play deprived are more likely to have autism, for example, yeah. more likely yeah. to have ADHD. So yes. there's lots of great research in that area, but it's kind of, kind of common sense, right? You know, there's kids have this nervous energy. They want to fidget. They want to move. And we constrain them oftentimes as, as adults, as their guardians, as their supervisors, as their teachers. Um, and we have legislation now which will state, oh, you know, you can't use a skipping rope because you might, you know, a jump rope because you might fall over and cut your knee. And yeah. you can't climb a tree because, you know, it's yeah. dangerous. And you, might break a leg. Yes. you might sue the school. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And this interesting research, again, three times as many kids, this is both in the US and the UK, Three times as many kids are admitted to ER or, you know, the emergency room or accident and emergencies, we say here in the UK, falling out of a bed than falling out of a tree. Yeah. And that's taken place in the, in, in the last generation. Yeah. Okay. So those are yeah. fis- official stats uh, yeah. by the CDC, na- National Vital st- t- uh, Statistics yeah. and the CDC and a similar body here in the UK tracking this and it's it's appalling right like it's appalling and it it, you're so right it's you know Stuart Brown I had actually a whole chapter on my book on play my first book uh the paleo cure and and how play you know is what we're saying here it's really as vital to human wellness and function as you know a proper diet getting enough sleep managing your stress and you know physical activity it's really we're biologically hardwired for it and part of that is is what you what you said it's 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 where we learn to actually negotiate ourselves in space how we learn you know relate to other objects in space other people it's how we learn things like balance and coordination it's where we try out certain strategies for getting our needs met you know oh this one works this one doesn't we 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 kind of experience the ebb and flow between cooperation and competitiveness and how that works and yes um and it's not just kids actually yeah he, he talks a lot about how ad, you know that continues to play a role for for adults you know as we yes, get older as, as long as we allow it to you know yes as long as we allow it to that adults play who play more are healthier as well not just kids i mean it, it's really uh that's something I love about your approach is it really incorporates that and recognizes the importance of that i mean for me like I'm a lifelong surfer and surfing is the, you know, it it satisfies so many different needs. I have the most fun doing that than anything else. I'm outside, I'm getting sun exposure. I'm in nature, I'm interacting, you know, the ocean, I'm moving my body in really whole ways, engaging all different parts of my body to move. There's a meditative aspect to it. You know, when you're sitting there and you're just waiting in between sets, it's a time where my head can go clear. I mean, that, that's like a, if I could do that every day, that's it. That would <laughs> yeah, yeah. do anything else. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I can't because of my other obligations and where I live. So for me, it's yeah. kind of been like how on the days when I can't surf, how what how can I re- try to recreate all of those different things in my daily routine? And you know what? I've come to the conclusion that play is um, as adults. Sometimes we we state that play is an activity. Right. rather than as kind of a state. So in some respects, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. You can take that play ethos and intersperse that with your work, with your interactions with, with other people. And it, it took me being a formerly very serious guy. You know, I, I'm, I'm probably was, uh, you know, I'm a reformed, serious individual who's now very no, much trying no. to pick, pick people up when he <laughs> yeah. sees them and car- carries them for a while. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'm on this playful path now yeah. and I, and I recognize that, you know, play can also be very, very serious. It isn't just about in quotation marks having fun. Sometimes when your daughter's playing, you're not going to see any obvious signs of joy in her face. You're going to see concentration and focus and uh, are trying to, as you say, to work out, to navigate, make decisions, to become more creative. And so as an adult, you know, Einstein once said that play is the highest form of research. Right. So in some respects, play is a, is a superset of, of work. You know, work confines us, constricts us, puts us in a box play allows us to explore and, and experience uh, things that there's no way we would be able to 
uh, unless we were in that kind of playful state. So I would say, and I would suggest that, yes, it's great to be able to say, you know what, surfing is my form of meditation, my form of fun and play, and I wish I could do that all of the time. But some of those things, because you've experienced that, you know some of those things you can bring into your daily practice. Yeah, right? do. Yeah. yeah it so, informs so, uh, that, they inform my life. It's, there's a uh, two-way relationship there. Exactly. And I really struggled with that because, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of say to yourself, no, I'm, a, I'm an adult, right? I've got to behave like adults do. And I've got to push childish behavior to one side. And again, we, don't, we confuse childish with childlike. So being childlike and actually having an innocence about the world around you is a beautiful thing. You know, you wake up, do you remember when you were a kid and you'd wake up every single day and go, oh my goodness, you know, this whole world is amazing. This environment is amazing. My friends are amazing. The whole world is, I just love everything and everyone and every experience. And then you start getting bogged down (laughs) with growing up and responsibility and becoming more and more serious. And so there were times where I I want to feel that again. I want to be nostalgic about that. I want to get up in the morning and go, isn't it just fantastic to be alive? You know, like, isn't that wonderful? And now I, I, I feel that I'm in a much better place because I can re-experience this again without being like a brat, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I, can, <laughs> I can take the childlike aspects, which are really rewarding and really helpful and really beneficial, and I can cast aside the elements of me that was very childish that I would not want to repeat as now as an adult. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, Daryl, this has been so much fun. A fantastic conversation. I love your work. Uh, The book is Animal Moves, How to Move Like an Animal to Get You Leaner, Fitter, Stronger, and Healthier for Life. It's on everywhere. (laughs) Amazon, (laughs) Amazon UK, iBooks, bookstores, you name it. And and then Daryl also has a really cool online programs because, you know, some of this stuff, a uh, book is, I love books. I write books. I read tons of books. Sometimes watching video, especially with movement, can be really helpful. And I know there are some fantastic courses online at primalplay.com, including a 30-day animal moves challenge, which I know is very popular. And yeah, thanks for, for doing this work and spreading this important message, Daryl, and look forward to seeing you probably at the next Paleo FX. Yes. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a pleasure, Chris. I really enjoyed the conversation. And yeah, thanks very much for, for being such a great yeah, host. My pleasure. Go, go and get the book, folks. It's fantastic. And we'll talk to you next time. Send in your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question. See you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.